Welcome, everybody, to the third session of uh, uh, our Reconceptualizing International Law series. Um, for those who've made the major life mistake of not being here previously, uh, my name is Daniel Stewart. I'm the founder and executive director of Independent International Legal Advocates, um, which we'll touch on in a second. Let me thank, first of all, our, our co organizers. Uh, Gibson Dunn, LLP, the International Arbitration and Litigation Group, uh, UCLA Law School, uh, ourselves and our co-hosts, the National University of Singapore uh, Center of International Law. Uh, this is the, the third session, as I said, uh, for those who are interested in our, our first and second sessions, both uh, launching the series from December and then a second session on transforming the making of international law, uh, any possible imaginary form, video, podcast, written summary are available uh, on our website. Um, I encourage you to, to check those out. Um, this series is focused essentially on looking at uh, core topics of international law and thinking of practical, concrete, tangible ways of, uh, of examining the necessary transformations to both affect the unfairness at the heart uh, of international law or potential unfairnesses and uh, uh, making international law a more effective, efficient, just and fair tool to achieve those ends uh, into 2021 and beyond. Um, a bit of a plug or highlight the, the next, there are at least another three, if not more sessions to come. I think we're planning for seven sessions or so in the fourth session on reconceptualizing humanities law, focusing on human rights law, international criminal law, uh, and humanitarian law, uh, tentatively dated for March 18th, 2021. Again, details to follow and spreading information in all those channels. Um, let me send a, a topical apology. Uh, one of our co-hosts and ILA advisory council member, uh, Professor Tendai Yishueme, who also is the UN Special Rapporteur on Racism, whose report uh, touching on themes uh, we'll talk about today that came out in 2019 is, is partly the sort of inspiration or uh, original brain uh, discussion. Um, she unfortunately can't be with us today, a combination of the time difference to the West Coast as it's 5.30 a.m. and also quite topically and on point that later on today, uh, she will be testifying uh, on the reparations bill uh, in front of the U.S. Congress. So um, we couldn't be better timed to discuss today. Uh, before I hand over to ILA's uh, legal Director Shirin, who will be our uh, Shirin Chua, who will be our moderator today. Again, I wanted to emphasize that uh, this whole series is, is part and parcel of the very heart, the mission of, of, of ILA uh, to build the capacity of small and developing states in addressing that unfairness and gaps at the heart of international law, um, and to make it a much more effective tool than perhaps it has historically. To achieve the lofty goals that we all want, we being both within international law and beyond. So, you know, we're delighted to have you know, such a austere uh, and wide-ranging, both geographically and experienced panel. But for that introduction, uh, I will hand over now to Shireen to lead us off. Shireen. Thank you, Daniel. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody, which is how all our panels in this series have started. Thank you very much to all of you for joining us. And thank you very much to our panelists for waking up early or staying up late as the case may be so that we could put together such a stellar panel to discuss this important topic across a 13 hour range of time zones. Um, as Daniel has alluded to, it's, 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 really, it's really quite apt that we are discussing this at the moment because in addition to Professor Achume testifying today before the US Congress on the reparations bill. It's also Black History Month, at least in the US. I think it's Black History Month is in October, I think in the UK and the Netherlands and other some other countries. Um, 2021 is also actually the 400th anniversary of the conquest of the Banda Islands, which is in now Indonesia by the Dutch East, Indi uh, East India Company, which is, I think, classically thought of as sort of the beginning of Dutch colonial conquest of what is now Indonesia. And we can probably loop back maybe to this case in the question and answer sessions, but it's that the Banda Islands is really quite a good example, I think, of the things that we'll be talking about today because there was basically a 
mass massacre and depopulation of the islands, um, and then followed by the mass transportation of slaves to the Banda Islands in order to um, run spice plantations, which I think, I don't want to preempt what uh, Professor Shepard and Ambassador Comichon will be talking about, but I think there'll be dynamics that will be brought up that are quite similar to the cases that they'll be speaking about um, in relation to the Caribbean. Um, and also finally, uh, last, mo last month in January, a uh, court in Paris heard the claims of several uh, organizations from Martinique and Guadeloupe on the mass use of chlordecone, which is a highly toxic substance um, that was banned in metropolitan France and then continued to be used in Martinique and Guadeloupe with you know, quite drastic environmental and public health consequences that are still being grappled with. Um, the case was brought in 2006 and I have not followed the procedural history of the case, but for various reasons, it has taken 15 years for it to be heard in Paris. So all in all, quite a really quite um, apposite moment for us to be discussing all this. And without further ado, I will turn to introduce our distinguished panelists before explaining the format of the webinar. So our first speaker will be Professor Virin Shepard, um, joining us from Kingston, Jamaica. She is the director for the center, sorry, director of the Center for Reparations Research at the University of West Indies. She is currently also the vice chair of the UN Committee for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination and previously chair of the UN Working Group of Experts on People of African Descent. Our second speaker will be Professor Anthony Angi, currently professor of international law at the National University of Singapore and also the University of Utah. He is also currently the head of teaching and researching international law in Asia, also known as the TRILA program at the Center for International Law at NUS, who is one of our co-sponsors, as you heard. Our third speaker will be Professor Venden Herrick, Professor of Public International Law at the Grotia Center of International Legal Studies at Leiden University. Professor Venden Herrick is also chair of the advisory committee on public international law issues to the Netherlands government. And finally, we have Ambassador David Comichon, Ambassador of Barbados to CARICOM, in which capacity he has been active in the CARICOM's reparation, reparative justice initiative, engaging, as I understand it, with the UK government on reparations for native genocide, transatlantic the transatlantic slave trade and a racialized system of chattel slavery. So those are our speakers. We're very excited to hear from them. Uh, just a word, so a word on the format. The panelists will first be making individual remarks of approximately 10 minutes each. And then we will turn to the round table segment, which is where I will abuse my position as moderator of the panel to ask such a wonderful panel, all the questions that I wonder about in my geeky spare time. But participants can also post questions. The Q&A chat function is already open. So if you type your questions in there, I will work them into our roundtable questions as we go along. So without further ado, I will let Professor Shepard um, start our discussion. Professor Shepard, please. Thank you very much. Greetings, everyone, and uh, thanks for including me in this discussion. I applaud the conceptualizers, the co-sponsors, and the co-organizers of this forum and greet my fellow panelists. As the synopsis sent to the panelists indicate, it is indeed a basic principle of international law that legal wrongs entail state responsibility, in particular to make reparations. Despite the fact that, as you say, the principles and practice of responsibility for colonization and enslavement remain contested, and I might add unacknowledged by the perpetrators of the great wrong, activists from a wide cross-section of disciplines and interest groups continue to lobby for reparatory justice. The Center for Reparation Research, of which I'm, on, I'm director, is part of that global movement for reparatory justice. Officially launched in October 2017, the CRR, as we call it, was created to promote research on an advocacy and engage in advocacy around the legacies of the transatlantic trade in enslaved Africans, African enslavement, colonialism, and its legacies in the Caribbean, 
and help to bring justice and positive transformation to societies affected by these legacies. Its establishment came out of the decision by the heads of government of CARICOM at its 34th regular meeting in July 2013 in Trinidad and Tobago, following a proposal from the Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Dr. the Honorable Ralph Gonzalez, to, to engage the United Kingdom and other former colonial European nations on the matter. The University of the West Indies was tasked with offering leadership and facilitating research to advance the regional cause for reparation. And the center has been doing just that as it is part of a global project to seek accountability and justice for colonization, enslavement, and the perpetuation of colonialist ideologies and practices like racial discrimination. We have been called upon frequently to provide education around the justification for the movement. And we ground this discussion within the context of colonial wrongs. In the case of the Caribbean, I think that the colonial wrongs are well-researched and publicized. But briefly, we charge European governments because they were owners and traders of enslaved Africans. They instructed genocidal actions upon indigenous communities. They created the legal, financial, and fiscal policies necessary for the enslavement of Africans. They defined and enforced African enslavement and native genocide as being in their national interests. They refused compensation to the enslaved with the ending of their enslavement, but compensated the enslavers. And they imposed a further 100 years of racial apartheid upon the emancipated. They have refused to acknowledge such crimes or to compensate victims and their descendants. Royal families throughout Europe developed financial interest in the trafficking. Monarchs from King Louis XVI of France, King George I of England, King Christian IV of Denmark, and King Gustavius Adolphus of Sweden had mutual interest in the trade's prosperity. State-sponsored companies from Portugal's Cachoa Maranhoa and Preda Buca companies to Holland's West India Company and Britain's Royal Adventures trading to Africa and the Royal African Company and South Sea Company were granted exclusive licenses to operate in the transshipment of millions of Africans. The continuing harm of the initial wrongdoing is all around us, but the psychological damage has been immense, which is why the CARICOM 10-point action plan for repatriate justice includes psychological re rehabilitation as a demand. I know that first Marcus Garvey and then Bob Marley said, none but ourselves can free our minds. But why did our minds need freeing in the first place? How did colonization impact our minds, our thoughts, our psyche so much so that the ideology of white supremacy continues into the present to do damage to people of African descent? So I wish to single out discrimination based on color as one of the manifestations of the psychological harm. This is practiced in societies that are state parties to the International Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination because Article 1 defines racial discrimination as any distinction, exclusion, restriction, or preference based on race, color, descent, or national or ethnic origin, which has the purpose or effect of nullifying or repairing the recognition, enjoyment, or exercise on equal footing of human rights and fundamental freedoms in the political, economic, social, cultural, or any other field of public life. But on the contrary, the, as you can see in slide one, the color hierarchy of slavery has not disappeared. And the color gradations make for curious reading in the 21st century, but had meaning in the period of enslavement. And the Spaniards were even more sophisticated in, and accounted for many other combinations. The practical manifestation of this color hierarchy, this privileging of color, was the privileging of mixed race people under slavery. And if you look at slides two and three, you will see that this was played out under slavery. You will see the ways in which color and race mixture determine occupation with a high correlation between mixed race and non-field occupation. Sambo, mulatto, quadroon, and quintroon men and women being tradesmen and women or being placed as nursemaids and housemen and women 
I looked at three plantation lists for 1789 and 1805, and it is quite clear. Artisans, the skilled artisans were mixed race men. Those in the house were mixed race women. And even the children who were mixed race were given different kinds of occupation. But the most backbreaking drudge work was reserved for black people. Eber Dick, for example, was in the field. So were Coromanti, Thomas, and Congo Harry, as black and African as they come. The superstructure of this system was racism, inequality, and an ideology of white supremacy in colonial society. Clearly, social forces or policies that have racially disparate adverse effects are discriminatory by result, whether intended or not. So ranking remains the engine that drives the political sociology of the Caribbean and the fight and racially discriminatory behavior continues. And the reports by the working group of experts and by the special rapporteur on racism, Professor Achume, confirm all of this. So the members of the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination are part of this fight to end racial discrimination as outlined in, in Article 1. So, you know, the obligation that we have is not exceptional, but is rather a core principle of the UN human rights system. And every major human rights treaty envisions access adequate redress for violation. And I agree with the special rapporteur that despite ratification of treaties and general recognition of their obligation to provide reparations, most states have failed to guarantee sufficiently comprehensive recognition, remedies, and, and uh, reparation. So to conclude, the burden of my paper has been to argue, as the special rapporteur did, that reparations for slavery and colonialism include not only justice and accountability for historic wrongs, but also the eradication of persisting structures of racial inequality. So the ranking system that we're left with is a carryover from enslavement. Ranking is understood historically within the colonial formation in terms of access to restricted status as manifested primarily in signs and symbols that with social consensus offer respect and, res and respectability. And the, regardless of what people are doing to deny the claim for reparation, as you see in the slide called Arguments for Reparation, we in the Caribbean know that a defendant or perpetrator exists. There is no denying the fact that plantation slavery provided the scaffold for Britain's industrial uh, advancement. And the injustice is well documented. The victims are identifiable. And as far as I'm aware from international law, the right to reparation is recognized as slide six is showing. The, the right to reparation is recognized by international law. And there is, no, uh, there is also precedent for the payment of reparation. I heard somebody talk about Haiti. So historical injustices have undeniably contributed to the poverty, underdevelopment, marginalization, social exclusion, economic disparities, instability, and insecurity that affect many people in different parts of the world, in particular in developing countries. And that's what the Durban Declaration and Program of Action reinforced. So our claim is on these countries that you see in this slide. And I end with a cartoon because for the first time I'm seeing cartoonists in our major um, newspapers engaging with the issue of repatriate justice, asking the British, based on the Zong tragedy, why not reparation? Stuart Hall is therefore correct to assert that the persistence of such colonial creation as ranking based on color is the cultural desire of postmodern mentalities for the celebration of difference in an egalitarian fashion rather than hierarchy, hierarchically. Thank you. Thanks very much, Professor Shepard, for setting up so clearly the historical context reparations in the Caribbean context and for, in particular, drawing so clearly the link between historical slavery and other colonial wrongs and contemporary um, issues of racial discrimination and all the consequences that they have. 
Um, and we could speak about the historical context forever, but unfortunately we only had 10 minutes, but we can come back to several of these themes in the roundtable uh, Q&A session. So next I invite Professor Angi to take us away on the legal aspects of reparations. Professor Angi, please. Um, well, thanks very much, uh, Shireen. And uh, let me thank uh, the Independent International Legal Advisors and Gibson, uh, Gibson Dunn and Croucher um, and uh, the various other parties involved in uh, organizing this very important initiative. And I feel very honored to be part of uh, such a distinguished panel. And I've already learned a great deal from uh, Professor Shepard about uh, the situation in the Caribbean, which of course has much further implications as well. Um, I'll just talk briefly in my presentation, if I might share a screen, um, about, uh, uh, as Shireen said, some of the legal aspects uh, of uh, reparations. Uh, Professor Shepard has already pointed to some of these, and perhaps the most important uh, legal aspect, which is the obligation to pay reparations. Um, perhaps I could place all this in the context of the topic that is most uh, perhaps uh, directly relevant as far as classic international law is concerned. And that is a body of law called state responsibility. And um, we can see that, um, you know, uh, I've tried to uh, provide a sort of rough outline of what state responsibility is about. And um, I uh, relied on the definition provided by Professor James Crawford, who uh, it was, is not only a very distinguished international lawyer, but was a special rapporteur on the articles of state responsibility. And so we could see the law of state responsibility as concerned with the incidents and consequences of unlawful acts, and particularly the forms of reparations for loss caused. Um, so this body of law is to be found in, uh, the, in the articles uh, on state responsibility, uh, which have been drafted by the International Law Commission and which are mentioned uh, by Professor Achiumi in her report. So much of the legal debate about uh, reparations focuses on the principles outlined in uh, these uh, articles of state responsibility. Uh, because as I said, uh, these articles of state responsibility outline the circumstances in which uh, particular parties can be held responsible for wrongdoing and the consequences that follow. One of the major uh, problems uh, that is presented, and so here we have, uh, I do, cited the cause of uh, factory case, uh, which is also cited in Professor Achiumi's uh, um, uh, in her uh, report. Uh, it is a principle of international law and even a general conception of law that, I'm sorry, a breach of an engagement involves an obligation to make a reparation. So a violation of the law leads to an obligation to make reparations. The complication is that the articles of state responsibility also include the principle of intertemporal law. And uh, this is the principle that an act must be illegal at the time it was committed. And so one of the major legal or classic legal arguments made about this whole issue of reparations for slavery and colonialism is the argument that at the time that slavery was at its height, slavery was not illegal under international law. So, the, uh, so uh, we can see perhaps uh, some of the comments made or some in the Durban Declaration, uh, the comment in particular that slavery um, uh, was and always should have been a crime against humanity seems in some way to sort of suggest that it has not always been a crime against humanity. And so uh, this uh, presents at least under classical international law, a major complication in terms of claiming reparations. In other words, at the time that all these terrible things were taking place, they were not illegal under international law. Now I'll, I'll brief, and so there are other issues as well, such as who can bring a claim and issues of, of attribution. In other words, who can be held responsible? Uh, can states be held responsible for all the acts relating to slavery? So there are a, whole, a series of issues that are raised by the articles of state responsibility in terms of the issue of reparations. Now, let me just mention briefly one case, which is, the case that I felt came closest to this whole issue of a, sex, a successful claim for reparations under international law. And this was a case involving a little island in the Pacific called Nauru, and the case that Nauru brought against Australia in the International Court of Justice. And uh, this was a case that arose as a result of uh, a situation where Australia administered the island of Nauru uh, 
as trustees, first under the League of uh, Nations and then under the UN trusteeship system. Uh, Australia was supposed uh, to look after the people of Nauru, and this is a basic principle of trusteeship. The trustee's obligation is to promote the political, economic, social, and educational advancement of the inhabitants of the trust territories and uh, ensure their progressive development towards self-government. I'm sorry, my PowerPoints are not very good. I should be checking my PowerPoints more closely. But the basic uh, argument is that Australia had to play the role of trustee, but instead of looking after the people of Nauru and their resources, Australia really uh, engaged in the act of mining out the island because Nauru was very rich in phosphates. And so Australia, rather than looking after the inhabitants, mined out uh, a good part of the island, leaving, leading to the, the devastation that uh, we can see here. Now, uh, the point is that uh, Nauru remarkably had the standing to bring an action against Australia in the International Court of Justice. And so I was looking forward to this case as perhaps resulting in uh, some sort of judicial pronouncement by the International Court of Justice about the issue of violation of the rights of colonized peoples and the possibility of reparations. Um, Nauru, in effect, uh, succeeded in the first phase of the case, which was the jurisdiction phase of the case. And then, for better or worse, the case was settled. Australia settled the case by paying Nauru um, uh, something like $200 million in compensation. And so it was um, this very ambiguous situation in which um, Nauru uh, actually got some kind of remedy, but there wasn't a judicial pronouncement about this whole complex issue of colonial reparations. Um, what is remarkable about that case, I think, is that the case was actually, uh, 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 that, that the case actually went through uh, and that all the difficult and stringent rules of state responsibility were satisfied in this case. So this is the exception really to all the difficulties that are posed generally by the articles on state responsibility in terms of reparation. And a major theme here is this idea of trusteeship. And I would suggest that perhaps one uh, legal principle to think about in the context of reparations is the argument that there is within colonialism, a principle of trusteeship. Uh, and this is an argument that was made even in the 16th century by European international lawyers trying to justify colonialism. The argument is we are looking after these people for their best interests. Okay, I'll just leave that uh, as an issue that we might talk about later. But all these complications about reparations and the articles of state resp responsibility do not really seem to operate in other circumstances. So this goes to an issue which uh, Prof Professor Achiumi pointed out, which is, and I agree with her completely, the articles of state responsibility themselves are a product of, I would say, a colonial international law. Let me look at another instance in which reparations have been claimed, compensation has been claimed. And this is the compensation claimed by the British from China as a result of the First Opium War. And uh, as many of you might know, um, uh, Britain waged war against China because China wanted to prevent the opium trade that was so important to the English East India Company and the British Empire. And after um, the conclusion of the war, uh, Britain included in the Treaty of Nanjing this particular article. The government of Her Britannic Majesty, having been obliged to send out a, an expedition to demand and obtain re redress for the violent and unjust proceedings of the Chinese high authorities towards Her Britannic Majesty's officers and subjects, the Emperor of China agrees to pay the sum of $12 million on account of the expenses incurred. So can we see here that it is the victorious power that is establishing the rules under which compensation should be paid. And so it is quite remarkable here that in effect, Britain is saying, you China compelled us to wage war against you because you are trying to close your borders to the opium trade. You compelled us to wage war against you. And because you have engaged in this great violation of the law, we are claiming compensation of $12 million. And that compensation was considerable. And I think a, a Chinese scholar has mentioned that this compensation is actually uh, more than the United States paid for the Alaska purchase. So can we see here that all the issues about compensation 
are actually dissipated by a simple assertion of authority and power. And this takes us to what I would call the trail point in terms of the, the law of state responsibility, which is what is the history of the law of state responsibility? What are the interests that have been uh, expressed and furthered through the development of that particular law? So in other words, there's a whole political and legal context of the development of that law that we perhaps need to take into account when thinking about applying those principles to remedying the problems of colonialism. So I hope we can see the issue and the complication here. Um, I just wanted to also point out here that race and the issue of racism and the issue of racial discrimination is not by any means to be seen, at least in my view, as being a purely North-South issue. I just want to mention the Bandung Declaration of 1955 here, where it is clear that racism is condemned by all the countries of the South who were present at Bandung. But I would also draw attention to that final paragraph, which says, it reaffirmed the determination of Asian African peoples to eradicate every trace of racialism that might exist in their own countries and pledged to use its full moral influence to guard against the dangers of falling victims to the same evil in their struggle to eradicate it. I find this a very powerful statement because Bandung recognized the great evils of racism as expressed through colonialism. But Bandung also understood that race, racialism and racial discrimination was an issue that existed within Southern countries themselves. So this, isn't, this is issue of racial discrimination isn't by any means a purely North-South issue. And uh, the tragic history of many countries in the South and the racism that we find in many uh, countries in the South it calls for a re-evaluation re of this situation. My final slide is uh, the slide in relation to the Haitian Revolution. And as many of you, uh, uh, as has already been, been pointed out, the great irony of the Haitian Revolution is, it, is the fact that it was the slaves, it was Haiti that had to pay reparations to France. So again, I take this incident as being in a way very symbolic because my argument is that in fact, we can see the Haitian revolution and what followed from it as being somehow historically significant because a, a huge uh, amount in reparations had to be paid. And of course the interest uh, made the sum even greater. But I want to point to this in response to a, an argument that is often made uh, as a way of trying to oppose reparations. The argument made is something like a system of reparations or reparations of slavery and colonialism will disrupt the entire international system. This will be a radical transformation. It will uh, completely uh, disrupt the system of international relations that now exists. The argument I would make based on what happened in the Haitian revolution is that there is in place already a whole law of reparations. And it is a system of the law of reparations in which the South continues to pay reparations to the North. In other words, the colonized continue to pay reparations to their former colonial masters. And the Haitian revolution gives us a sense of how this happens because upon independence, we have this whole phenomenon of debt. And there's a massive flow of resources from the South to the North, as we can see from some of the figures in terms of the ongoing debt issues that are faced by the South. So in fact, uh, the argument I would make here is that there's already a system of reparations in place. And that is a system that we might think of or know of as the system that we call international economic law. Because international economic law and all the structures supporting it result in the ongoing payment of reparations by the South to the North. Thanks. Thank you very much, Professor Angi, for arising to the occasion of explaining the potential and pitfalls of the law of state responsibility in relation to reparations in 10 minutes. Um, there's, you've already given us much food for thought, which I'm sure we'll come back to in the roundtable session. Um, next, I'll pass the metaphorical mic to Professor Vanden Herrick to continue our discussion on international law and reparations. Professor, please. 
Thank you, uh, Shireen. Thank you, Daniel, uh, all the organizers for um, inviting me. I'm very pleased to uh, participate in this lecture series on uh, reconceptualizing international law uh, to engage with the very important work of uh, Special Rapporteur Akumi. And uh, I'm also very uh, uh, pleased to be participating in this uh, high level panel. Thank you, Professor Shefford and Professor Angie for your enlightening um, uh, interventions. I feel it's a great privilege to be on this panel with you. So what I thought uh, might be useful for our discussion today and what I can bring to this uh, discussion is to share with you some of the developments that are ongoing in the Netherlands uh, pertaining to its role as a uh, former colonial power. And then on the basis of that practice uh, in the uh, Q&A, we can jointly discuss what are the shortcomings, uh, what are steps still to be taken, at which level uh, those steps should be taken, uh, how they should be taken, but also those deeper questions on the role of law and the need to reconceptualize laws and existing legal doctrines. Now, the picture uh, that I'm going to uh, share with you, present to you, is a very uh, mixed picture. It's a picture of some steps being uh, made in the past year, uh, in the past decennium, um, and there are some notable uh, developments, uh, but it's also very much a picture of resistance and uh, reservation, I must say. So I think the, the starting point for a reflection on Dutch uh, appreciation of its own colonial past is to say that for a very long time, time, until really only very recently, there was uh, almost no to very little critical engagement in Dutch society with our own colonial uh, past. And, and I think we should also say that this reluctance to critically engage with our colonial role is very much present still today in um, Dutch uh, society. And I think if we look at last year, 2020, it's very good illustration of this mixed uh, picture of, of steps being taken on the one hand, but of uh, quite intense resistance uh, on the other. So last year, 2020, uh, was in the Netherlands a year of uh, apologies, but it was also a year of refusal to apologize. So it started on 26 January, then our Dutch uh, Prime Minister, uh, for the first time in history, he apologized for the failure of the Dutch state to protect uh, Jews during the Second World War. Now, obviously, this is not directly related to uh, colonialism, but it set the tone for things to come, because then a few weeks later, uh, in March 2020, during a royal visit to Indonesia, the King Willem Alexander, he expressed uh, regret and apologies for the excessive violence by the Dutch. However, in the same year, uh, in July, Prime Minister Rutte, he expressly refused to offer apologies for Dutch participation in uh, slavery and slave trade. And actually, a few days ago, he repeated this. Now, while the Prime Minister explained the timing of the apologies to, uh, on the failure to protect Jews uh, uh, during the Second World War, he explained it by underscoring the need to make a statement against anti-Semitism, but then one of the reasons he gave for not apologizing for slavery was that he said that it would polarize uh, Dutch society. So I think 2020 is, is exemplary in a way for the phase that the Dutch society is in now. It is a phase of progress, but also enduring uh, resistance. Now, 2020 is not the a turning point. Uh, I think there was a turning point or at least a certain opening up uh, that came a bit earlier, around a decade ago. It was, of course, not one moment, but what was very important in this movement to open up a little bit, also from a legal perspective, was the civil litigation that uh, occurred against the state of the Netherlands in Dutch courts, and it's ongoing uh, today. But it started with a judgment in September 2011. And in this judgment, uh, in a case brought by Indonesian uh, widows, the court of first instance of The Hague held the Dutch state responsible, liable for damages uh, to the widows for the summary executions of their husbands in an Indonesian uh, village committed in 1947. Now, this case is revolutionary for many reasons, but from a legal perspective, one of the most notable features of this um, uh, judgment was how the court dealt with this question of statutory limitation. So in the report of uh, Special Rapporteur uh, Akjumi, and also referred to by Professor Engi, uh, she emphasizes that questions of intertemporality are one of the most important legal hurdles that former colonial states in particular 
uh, often present in discussions on colonization and, and slavery. And they also played a role in this case because in the Dutch um, civil code, there is an absolute time bar to bring uh, cases of five years. And, um, um, and, and after those uh, five years claims are uh, time barred, uh, five years after they become claimable. So there's some flexibility in determining when claims become claimable, but still it's quite an absolute uh, bar and there's no um, uh, exception to it in uh, law. Now, despite that, despite the bar being absolute, the court uh, of first instance said that it was unreasonable for the Dutch state to invoke those statutory limitations, and it set them aside on that basis. And it referred to the fact that this was an exceptional case, there was no precedent in Dutch case law, and we were talking about very grave uh, offenses. And uh, they also referred to the fact that the Dutch state had had immediate knowledge of the offenses and um, that the acts were regarded as wrongful under Dutch law at the time they were uh, committed. Um, so after this case, um, a string of cases uh, followed that expanded the president. So it was not only uh, a compensation offered to uh, widows, but also to other relatives, children. And it was also for other acts, not only executions, but also for acts of uh, rape and torture committed by uh, the Dutch in those uh, days. And the cases are ongoing um, today. So compensation has been ordered, statutory limitations have been set aside, but uh, the cases still show very uh, complicated uh, questions um, about um, evidentiary questions are very difficult. Uh, there are still questions to what extent the time bar should be set aside. Um, uh, there are questions on whether there should be lump sum compensation or not. Uh, and, and overall, the, the, the procedures are very lengthy, which is, of course, uh, problematic also given the age of the litigants um, involved. Now, Apart from um, uh, the litigation, uh, there's also other follow-up action taken after this 2011 uh, judgment, and three are important in particular. Firstly, um, the government created a civil settlement scheme to compensate uh, widows, but also here we saw that uh, evidentiary hurdles were complicating factors, and there was still resistance of, of, of uh, yeah, the government in in, um, in, in determining the, the contours of this settlement. Uh, another step was that the Dutch court had uh, ordered actually the Dutch state to apologize. This was done by the ambassador first, then by the king, as I just mentioned. And a third um, follow-up step was that there is now a large scale historical inquiry ongoing, uh, which will present its findings this uh, year. And um, maybe I should say that I'm a member of the scientific advisory board of this inquiry, um, but it's, it's the renewed inquiry in this period, 1945-1949. Now, if we appraise those uh, developments in the context of our discussion of uh, today, I think we could say that they are positive to the extent that they uh, contrast with the preceding silence uh, uh, on colonial past in the Netherlands. So these developments are part of, and they triggered a reorientation process within the Netherlands and Dutch society about how to understand their own past. Um, they're also positive in the sense that the course case is illustrative of a point that uh, Special Rapporteur makes in her report, that these legal hurdles to reparations and these um, questions of intertemporality, they can be overcome. Time bars can be set aside on legal grounds, on convincing legal grounds. Um, then uh, uh, I think there are also some, uh, some buts. Uh, as I said, there was quite some resistance in, uh, in this case in terms of uh, by, by the government, but also by the courts in terms of how to deal with evidentiary uh, requirements. There was a very strict approach to that. Uh, the way in which the apologies were made, uh, I think there's something to be said about that as well. But I think the biggest but is that if we ask the question, which is one of the lead questions of today, whether these Dutch court cases and these other initiatives, are they now examples of a nascent conceptualization of international legal responsibility for colonization? If that's the question, then I think the answer should be uh, no. And the thing is that all these initiatives, um, all these legal cases, they regarded, as I said, acts that were committed in a very specific time, time frame, 1945, 1949. Uh, so after the Second World War, um, Indonesia claimed independence, uh, uh, 17 August 1945. 
So they did, did not see themselves as colonized anymore. The Netherlands did not recognize it, and it started what uh, it then called the police actions, which led to armed conflict, which lasted until 1945. Now, it's widely accepted, even in the Netherlands, that this term police action is not uh, adequate. But the uh, alternative terms that are being used now are recolonization war or decolonization war, depending on the perspective. Um, but I think the broader point is that all the cases and the initiatives that I just referred to, they focus on a very limited period and they do not put on trial or put into question, really, the colonial enterprise as such. So, um, and, and I think in the report, uh, uh, the special rapporteur, she makes a differentiation about implicating individual wrongful acts on the one hand and implicating entire legal, economic, social and political structures. And so the cases do the first, but they don't really touch upon uh, the latter. So what we see really is that the Netherlands is now prepared to look back at this four year period. And it's even prepared to ask a question whether the violence that was used in that period, which we, we used to call exceptional or excess, whether that was actually structural uh, rather than, than exceptional. So those types of questions are on the table, but it is a limited preparedness to uh, look back and to revisit. Um, uh, there is resistance, as I said, even in those cases, but it's in particular limited because it does not really regard the colonial period as uh, such, just as the prime minister was not prepared to apologize for the Dutch role in slavery and slave trade as uh, such. So I think what we see is that there's a process of reorientation ongoing. We see a reserved um, position by the government. We do see that cities, Amsterdam, Rotterdam, the Dutch central bank, they're perhaps now taking over, they're taking the lead and uh, they are looking into their own roles um, uh, in relation to uh, uh, slavery and also discussing what the consequences thereof should be. Um, um, so it, it has gone a level down in, in a way. The, um, the government has uh, created an, a dialogue group uh, specifically on uh, uh, slavery. It's not a legal exercise, but it will um, uh, offer recommendations also this year. And those recommendations may, of course, have legal implications or legal connotations. Uh, it may, for instance, recommend that the Dutch should um, qualify slavery and slave trade as a crime against humanity in Dutch law, or it may uh, offer recommendations on, on reparatory guarantees um, uh, in relation uh, to slavery in uh, Dutch law. Um, so what we see, I think, is a picture of going back and forth of progress and resistance of interplay between the legal, the political, the historical, the ethical and the moral, and the resistance is not equally divided uh, among those. There's one last advice that I perhaps uh, can mention. Um, uh, it's an advice that was issued last year about looted colonial uh, art. And I think if we speak about um, reconceptualization and, and rethinking approaches, it's a noteworthy uh, advice. In that report, uh, there's an unequivocal uh, statement that whatever perspective is taken, violence, exploitation, racism, and repercussion, repression, are recurrent elements of uh, colonization. The report also details the Dutch uh, colonial actions. And on that basis, it advises the Dutch government uh, to take a number of steps. It says uh, the first step that the government should take in relation to looted colonial art is to recognize that uh, by taking position of those uh, cultural objects against uh, the will of uh, uh, the populations uh, in the colonies, the original populations, an injustice has been committed. And it also says that to repair that injustice, um, the Netherlands should express, must express um, its intent of unconditional uh, return whenever there is reasonable certainty that the objects were taken by force. So it's about estimation of uh, involuntary nature rather than definitive uh, proof. And it's an advice based more on ethical principles and not so much uh, on, on, on uh, the law um, or making an argument on, on the law. So um, yeah, I think that is some of the Dutch practice that, that uh, we have. As I said, it's a very mixed uh, picture and I look very much forward to discussing with you what are next steps uh, to be made and where they should be made um, um, in which arena, so to say. So thank you very much. <laughs>
Thank you very much, Professor Van den Herrick, for crystallizing so clearly um, through the Dutch example, the law and some of the practice that is currently still being developed and both their potential as well as their constraints perhaps that have to be overcome. Finally, we turn to Ambassador Commission to tell us about the CARICOM Reparative Justice Initiative. Ambassador, please. Yes, thank you. Good day to one and all. I am speaking to you from Bridgetown, Barbados in the Caribbean. The Caribbean community is a grouping of 20 states in the Caribbean. Um, 15 of them are full members of CARICOM. The other five are associate members. 14 of the 20 are independent states. Six are still um, colonies of various uh, European countries. So the Caribbean community, CARICOM for sure. Now, CARICOM's claim for reparations is based on the multiple genocides and crimes against humanity, crimes in international law that were committed against both the indigenous people of the Caribbean and the African and African descended people who were reduced to slavery in the Caribbean by the relevant national governments of Europe, their agents and subjects. The centuries of enslavement and colonization were characterized by the criminal brutalization of multiple generations of indigenous and African people, the unlawful deprivation of the fruits of the labor of multiple generations of enslaved indigenous and African people in the Caribbean, the siphoning off of the resources and labor value of the enslaved people of the Caribbean to the families, companies, institutions, and governments of the relevant European nations and the utilization of the inherently unlawful system of Caribbean-based trade and industrial production to fuel the commercial, industrial, infrastructural, and institutional development of the relevant European nations. And that tortured history has resulted in, firstly, the relative underdevelopment of our Caribbean nations, the relative social and economic developmental deficit that afflicts the mass populations of the countries of CARICOM, the development of Europe's wealthy industrial civilization, the establishment of an international economic and political order in which the formerly enslaved and colonized nations and peoples have been inserted in a structurally subordinate and exploitative manner. And finally, it has resulted in some degree of post-traumatic psychological and cultural damage to the formerly enslaved and colonized Caribbean peoples. And I want to be very clear about this final point. The reality is that all people are marked by traumatic experiences and we Caribbean people are no exception to this rule. In spite of the fact that we did resist the oppression, we did hold on to our intrinsic humanity and we did carry out an almost miraculous humanizing of the barbaric environment that we had been placed in. So we must be very clear about that. We therefore conceive of our claim to reparations as a collective and organized demand that those entities and institutions that were implicated in carrying out and benefiting from the criminal enterprise or that are rooted in 
and are reflective of the, of the unjust consequences of those centuries of criminal enslavement and colonization must now undertake some appropriate degree of responsibility for repairing the damage caused to the nations and people of the Caribbean. Properly understood, this claim to reparations, this call to repair the damage can be conceived of as an assertion that the formerly enslaved and colonized Caribbean nations and peoples now possess a fundamental and non-negotiable right to development. And if the formerly enslaved and colonized Caribbean nations and people now possess a fundamental right to development, then both the European nations that were implicated in enslavement and colonization and the economic and political institutions of the international order that grew out of and were shaped by the unjust consequences of those centuries of criminality are now bound by an equally fundamental and non-negotiable duty to facilitate the development of the formerly enslaved and colonized nations and peoples of the Caribbean. The other aspect of the damage the negative post-traumatic psychological and cultural effects also requires an organized effort of repair, but we will come to that later. CARICOM has therefore been insisting that that duty to facilitate our development must be carried out in the following manner. Firstly, the national governments of the liable European countries must be required to engage in and finance an extensive reparative developmental program along the lines prescribed by the CARICOM 10-point plan. As you might be aware, CARICOM launched its reparatory justice campaign in 2013 immediately established a CARICOM Reparations Commission to lead the campaign. And by early 2014, the CARICOM Reparations Commission had designed a reparations 10-point plan. It consists of, I, I'll run through it very quickly, one, a formal apology from the governments of the relevant European nations, two, a voluntary repatriation program for those diasporans who are interested in physically returning to the African continent. Three, an indigenous people's development program targeted at the remnants of the indigenous population still to be found in the Caribbean. Number four, a program to establish relevant and needed cultural institutions in the Caribbean. Five, a program to deal with the Caribbean's public health crisis. Six, an education development program in the Caribbean. Seven, an African knowledge program for people of the Caribbean component of the African diaspora. Eight, a systematic effort at psychological rehabilitation and healing. Nine, a technology transfer program. And 10, a process of debt cancellation of the national debts of CARICOM member states. And subsequently in October 2017, the CARICOM Reparations Commission added three additional demands. One, the establishment of a Caribbean Sustainability Fund to be financed by the relevant European governments. Um, secondly, the removal from places of public celebration monuments and statues of historical personalities who were implicated 
in the crime of enslavement. And, um, and finally, that October 12th, the day on which Christopher Columbus landed in the Caribbean in 1492 and commenced the African Holocaust, we designated Caribbean Holocaust Day. We can see from the foregoing that CARICOM has placed an emphasis on a remedy of development programs rather than merely on a money payment. And this is as it should be. While there is a legitimate place for a money payment as confirmed by the demand for a Caribbean sustainability fund, the truth is that one cannot siphon off a people's resources and the fruits of their labor for a period of several centuries and believe that a mere one-off money payment can repair the damage caused over such an extensive period of time. Indeed, if our Caribbean societies and economies are to be brought up to the level of social, industrial, and other economic development that they are entitled to, this is going to call for a concerted developmental effort over a substantial period of, of time. The second component of our reparations claim is uh, the second component of the duty to facilitate our development is that there must be a reparative restructuring of the international economic and political order and its major institutions along the following lines. Firstly, there must be a reparative restructuring of the unjustly skewed composition and voting rights of organizations such as the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, Inter-American Development Bank, the World Trade Organization, the United Nations Security Council. These, these organizations um, have locked out the, the representatives of the, the black countries of the world. There must also be a reparative restructuring of the inequitable terms of international trade. We, we are saying that all of these features of the international political and economic order are a product of those centuries of, of criminality. There must be a reparative restructuring of the currently existing inequitable rules and practices of the international financial system, inclusive of the rules and practices of the system of international economic governance. For example, the international financial institutions must be required to prioritize not only the extending of developmental credit to our nations, but to also facilitate extension of the fiscal space and latitude that our governments need if they are to properly respond to the urgent developmental needs of our people. Urgent developmental needs caused by those centuries of criminal um, exploitation. And just as we have directed a CARICOM 10 point developmental demand um, to the liable Western governments, there will be a similar demand to the international institutions for reparative justice and compensation in the form of the implementation of a global sustainable development regime, inclusive of payments of reparative compensation for the climate injustice our nations have been and are being subjected to. And once again, I stress that such measures are part and parcel of the carrying out of the duty to facilitate the development of the formerly enslaved and colonized nations and peoples of the Caribbean. Um, now, thus far, we are focused on national governments and international institutions, but the duty to facilitate the development of our people also extends to those European companies, institutions, inclusive of universities, and families that were implicated in or that benefited 
from the crime of enslavement. These private sector entities are therefore being requested and required to participate in a subsidiary reparations mechanism or program. This reparations program consists of efforts like the 20 million pound reparations compact entered into between the University of Glasgow and our own University of the West Indies. This is where the University of Glasgow, having done its research, recognized that it had benefited financially um, from that period of criminal enslavement of our people and have offered to make a reparatory um, payment um, to the tune of 20 million pounds in, in financing a developmental program with the, the University of the West Indies. Also, there, we have recently proposed setting up a fund into which relevant private sector European companies, institutions, and families will be requested to make reparation payments. I use the word subsidiary here in order to make a distinction between this effort and the fundamental reparations reckoning that must take place at the level of the national governments of Europe and the Caribbean, and also at the level of the international economic and political institutions. This fundamental reparations reckoning that encompasses both the national governments of Europe and the major international economic and political institutions will require CARICOM to engage in the highest and most extensive level of international diplomacy to engage the United Nations system. Indeed, if it proves impossible to negotiate and settle our reparations claim with the national governments of Europe, the United Nations may be required to establish a special international tribunal that is designed and equipped to handle a legal claim of the magnitude of our reparations claim. Um, the CARICOM governments have reached out to the European governments saying, let us sit down around a table, let us discuss this issue, and let us come to a negotiated um, reparation settlement. That's our preferred way of going about it. If that um, proves not to be possible, we will have to go the, the route, in my opinion, of a special international tribunal. However, the subsidiary reparations program that I have spoken about, um, that can be carried out at a lower level by our CARICOM Reparations Commission. And finally, so far as the element of post-traumatic psychological and cultural damage is concerned, we, the formerly enslaved and colonized people of the Caribbean, we must, in our own interests, undertake our own inward self-directed cultural and psychological re repairs. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador, for, the, for that very comprehensive set of comments, um, which gives us much to discuss, but I wanted to zero in immediately um, to your reference to the right to development and specifically the fact that in our last um, panel session, we had Professor Diane Disiato, who is on the UN, who is an expert on the UN Working Group on the Right to Development, and she um, brought up the Right to Development Treaty that's currently before the Human Rights Council. And so I think your explanation of it in the context of reparations in the CARICOMs. Uh, situation really nicely illustrates what we're trying to do through these series, which is to explore how the reconceptualization of international law is really intersectional and cuts across, or I mean, the full panoply of um, international law issues really, and can't really be seen in their silos. So with that, let's um, pull on straight into the round table session. Um, and Many questions have started coming in, so I will try my best to get through all of them. Um, so th the first question, maybe we'll go straight to maybe a little bit of an existential question, which is what 
should the role of law be um, in this context? Because, I mean, we're in a virtual room mostly full of lawyers, I think, and in rooms full of lawyers, there tends to be an assumption that law is really important, if not the most important. But actually, um, before we start to talk about how reconceptualizing international law in relation to colonial reparations looks like, perhaps we need to answer the question of what exactly law should do in this context. And by this, I, we, it's already been clear through the remarks of all the panelists that history, other disciplines are really important to the question of reparations for colonial laws. History is really important as Professor Shepard has amply demonstrated. And Professor Achume in her report has said that um, one of the most serious barriers to reparation besides you know, the limitations of classical international law is actually a lack of awareness as to history um, and persisting, persisting legacies of genocide, slavery and other colonial wrongs. There's also starting to be more wisdom and knowledge in really many, many disciplines, for example, um, medical science uh, in relation to you know, intergenerational health impacts, nutritional impacts. Um, I was struck reading the website of the CARICOM Reparations Commission ambassador that um, in fact, the, it's been demonstrated that the descendants of African slaves who were brought to the Caribbean had, the, had sort of health impacts that were disproportionate to the rest of the population. They have the highest incident of particular diseases that are the direct effect of trauma and um, brutalization and you know, nutritional um, issues at the time. So there's medical science in that regard. There's also increasing psycho, you know, knowledge in the field of psychology as to intergenerational trauma, which has been done on certain populations, but not. I mean, there's a lot of work that's still being done as to intergenerational trauma in the context of post-colonial states and peoples. So having, you know, in that context, I would invite the panelists to reflect on whether law, the role of international law should be to, you know, just get out of the way and let the moral political project of colonial reparations get on, I mean, let, you know, to let it get on without obstructing it with things like the intertemporal doctrine, or should law's role, or rather should we, should the project of reconceptualizing international law really be to formulate detailed rules that will positively drive or construct a responsibility and accountability regime. And I'm perhaps with this, I can start with um, Ambassador Komisho immediately. Um, given that, given that I, you know, in the context of the CARICOM reparations project, I'm sure that there's been a lot of reflection on the full panoply of issues, law, you know, history, morals, health. Well, um, first of all, law, international law is a dynamic thing. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that there, there is, there's quite a lot there in terms of um, sources of international law, this um, to pull together, to pull together um, a body of law that gives coherence to international law as it applies to reparations for slavery and colonization. Um, let, let me deal with something that Professor Angie mentioned in his contribution when he spoke about this idea that slavery was legal at the time it um, was committed. Now, this is something that the European statesmen um, to their utter shame and discredit have been, have been pushing. The reality is that in every single European country at the time of the commencement of the transatlantic slave trade, slavery had been, slavery had been abolished. Slavery was illegal in England, for example, when England commenced the transatlantic trade in, 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 in Africans now. Um, not only was slavery illegal, but rape was a crime. Kidnapping was a crime. 
mutilation was a crime, false imprisonment uh, were crimes. In um, what what happened was having instituted slavery in a colony, a colony like Barbados, and let's use Barbados as the prime example because um, the first British slavery codes were actually enacted by the colonial House of Assembly in Barbados. Go back and look at the text of those slavery codes of the 1660s and 1680s. What does the, the planter, slave master, planter dominated Barbados House of Assembly say? Well, it says that um, the law of the mother country cannot apply in this colony. And it says that um, slavery is fundamental to the success of this colony and that these creatures that we have brought from Africa are not really human beings. These are animal-like creatures, wild, barbarous, animal-like creatures, and therefore that the, the English system of law cannot be applied to these creatures. And therefore, a special um, colonial um, legal construct has to be put in place. Basically what they did, they passed a colonial act that declared that these African human beings were not really human, human beings. Um, they were animal-like creatures and therefore you could impose on them um, you could practices that in England would constitute the crimes of kidnapping, false imprisonment, um, mutilation, you know, assault and battery, and all the rest of it. Now, are we to accept that a colonial legislature had the power to transform human beings into wild animals? Or later on, they went on to, trans to purport to transform those human beings into real property, into chattels, into things, are we, to, are we to accept that a colonial act that attempted to carry out a factual absurdity, a factual um, impossibility, that that act has any legal validity? No, those colonial acts, you cannot transform a human being, you cannot by legislative finagling transform human beings into things or transform human beings into wild creatures and then impose some special um, legal regime on them. Those acts were null and void. So I'm saying that even within the, the currently accepted doctrines of law, we can, we, we can still come to a conclusion that um, slavery, transatlantic slave trade were illegal under the national laws of, 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 of the period, under the international law of the period, that they, were, that they were crimes against humanity, they were genocides, and that there's legal liability for them. What we, are, what we have to be very conscious of is that the currently existing international legal mechanisms, courts, um, the World Court, for example, um, we have to be very conscious that, um, you know, there are certain countries that have power within those institutions. And we have to be very careful about taking a legal case to a, a, a judicial institution where um, we may not get justice. We may not just get justice because certain powerful countries have their sway over these institutions. So we have to be very careful about bringing a case, um, getting a, a, a negative judgment, and therefore setting a legal precedent that, that, that prevents us from continuing with our, our, our reparations claim. But I, I am making the point, so you know, we, prefer, we prefer to go the route, let's, let's negotiate it, let's use the political mechanisms for dealing with this, with this matter, but law must always be the backup. Law, you know, the legal system must always be the backup. And I am saying that there is enough in 
in a, the existing legal system, if we if we if we bring it together, if we create that um, cohesive and comprehensive system of jurisprudence to address this matter, there is enough in the system for us to do that. But it will probably call for the United Nations at the level of the General Assembly to assert itself and to put that kind of process in motion. That's how I would answer your question. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, Professor Shepard, maybe I could, could I put you on the spot as the historian on the panelist to tell us what you would like to see international law do in relation to reparations as a historical moral project? Thank you. Well, first of all, in, in answer to the initial question about the role of international law and whether it should take precedence over other disciplines, I would say this is an interdisciplinary project. We need the medical people uh, to inform us and do the research, share research with us about the medical dimension of our claim. We talk about, we are looking at COVID-19 now and its um, impact, differential impact. We are hearing about comorbidities and that those people who have these comorbidities are the um, most likely to die. And we have to talk about why people of African descent are the ones who have, out of proportion to other groups, these comorbidities. They heart back to slavery. So we are talking about hypertension and type 2 diabetes. Those are the two that we have highlighted. So we need, we need the, the, the legal experts. We need historians. No, none of the other disciplines can function without history because we are marshalling the evidence which you will need lawyers as justification for why you're mounting this case. So we need the legal people to uh, take this case to the international community, whether through the GA, whether through the, 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 the CERB, the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, because that has been mounted. Um, you know, we have to find a route to the ICJ. So if we're going to take a legal route, then absolutely we need international lawyers those who are experienced in litigation, those who are experienced in putting forward claims for compensation, for reparation, to be in this struggle. Uh, we need the psychologists because we talked about the psychological harm. I, I talked about it, David talked about it. And so, so the point I'm making it, it is that it is a struggle that will need everyone on board, all the disciplines, lawyers, medical people, psychologists, historians, economists. And so we need to just ensure that in our struggle, we have this cohort. I want to, to say that, you know, they, when David spoke about the fact that laws were constructed to present African people as non-humans as an, as a, a, and as animals, I immediately said to myself, well, what does it say about the enslavers if they were raping animals, you know, because we know that this was one of the crimes um, during slavery. And we need lawyers to be able to push the case of the refusal to acknowledge the crimes and to compensate victims and their descendants. And this issue that it wasn't a crime when it happened. We need lawyers to unpack that for us because the historians can tell you about what happened. You lawyers have to say to us, well, based on all that you have said, absolutely, it was a crime then and it, it will be a crime now. I heard Professor um, talking about the Durban process and how uh, my, my uh, the chair of CARICOM Reparation Commission, Professor Sir Hilary Bettis, always says, Durban showed us the politics of should because it didn't come out and say um, that slavery and the king were crimes against humanity. He said, if it was now, it, it would have been, and it should have been. So I'm not so clear that Durban came down on that side. 
But I want to say this as I end my comments. When I think of the horrendous enterprise that turned Abba into an idiot, that caused Johanna to die because her body was ground in the mill, that caused Deborah to be still assigned to watching the gate of the plantation, even though she was old and sickly, that caused Sally to run away constantly from a rapist planter, even though she was brutally punished each time she was caught. I want to weep, but I celebrate with those who ran away, including Joan, who was entered as having been missing for 10 years from a Western Jamaica plantation. And I hope she found refuge in those maroon committees. I am saying historians have provided the evidence. We need the lawyers to take this now and fight the case for us. Thank you, Professor Shepard. Maybe I can turn now to Professor Venden Herrick and invite you, Professor, to answer the question of the role law should play. Um, but also specifically, maybe we'll merge this now with a, a second question, which is insofar as we turn to law, which fora um, should we use, particularly as you already alluded to in your remarks, whether we should turn to national courts and national fora or international courts and fora with their competing, you know, pros and cons, because as you, as the case, I think it was the Rawa Gedi case, if I'm getting it correct, that you alluded to, um, the intertemporality problem, I, 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 I gather was not a problem because those acts were illegal under Dutch law, whereas ironically at the time, as Professor Angi has alluded to, they may or may not have been legal under, well, it's a, it's a, it's one of the reasons why claims reparations are resisted, right? Because it was not illegal under international law at the time. But at the same time, the pitfall, as you've already mentioned, is the that it the cases can relate only to a specific period of time and with evidentiary burdens that can only cover relatively recent colonial wrongs. So I wonder if you, I, we would love to hear your thoughts, further thoughts on that. Yes, uh, thank you. There are actually many questions and big uh, ones. I think first, just a small remark on this question of whether something was legal or not at a given moment in time. Uh, uh, the answer to that question, of course, very much depends on our conception of law. So if we have a very, um, yeah, um, a more, let's say, traditional positivist uh, perspective that we refer to treaties or that we have a more uh, a naturalist approach where we look at general principles of uh, uh, law and, and uh, ideas uh, that also existed at the time. And I think that choice that, that you make is, is also informed, of course, well, it's informed by the person making that choice. And so that leads me in a way to your, to your other question about the forum and uh, where we should go, international forum or domestic. And, and I think that's not an either or question, but maybe there is a question of where do you start? And, um, and what I um, learned from, from looking at the Dutch um, development that are ongoing is that, um, um, yeah, is, 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 as I said, I mean, it's a, it's a story of progress, but it is really also a story of resistance. And that resistance that, that does not only come from the fact that, you know, fear of, 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 of compensation and financial uh, uh, consequences, but it really also comes from, I think, this point that you raised is a lack of awareness. Um, and and um, so I, I think a, a very important step that uh, that needs to be made now and that that is being made because of these cases that are ongoing uh, is um, a, a reor this yeah what I called reorientation process in the Dutch uh, society. That we look again and now we look at this period, but that we look again. And if you, I will tell you that if you ask. Um, people um, in the Netherlands about uh, the, the, the Banda Islands that you started with and, you know, this idea that maybe the Dutch committed genocide there, that I, I think that, that you will have a blank. People, have, they just, they are very ignorant uh, uh, about it. And the general idea that we have is, is more that we have been victims of um, German occupation and, and not the idea of ourselves as occupiers. So that word already that we don't, that, we, that doesn't connect. So I think what is very important is, is um, uh, and, and, and these developments that I refer to, they do um, 
create now a, a setting where where we are uh, invited or forced to revisit that. And I think it's a very important uh, step that needs to be made. And, and on the basis of that, you can make other steps. And then, sorry for being so long, but there's one final thing that I want to say, and that is that uh, Professor Shefford also said. And I really, I really want to underscore that uh, I think, indeed, disciplines need to go hand in hand here. And there's one step taken by one discipline and then the other by another dis and it goes back and forth fourth so also here it's not an either or and i think it's very true that that and i thought it was good that we had a historian first to open see because that's where it starts i really believe that's where it starts and then also i think historians can maybe show us the way if we need to think about how to reconceptualize international law or legal doctrines um uh, lawyers they're not always so innovative so we need to have input from the other disciplines um, uh, yeah, to show us the way. So I think it's very much that. Um, so, but I do think that the, in, the domestic level needs input also from the international. And so this is really my final remark. The, this reorientation process that we had in the Netherlands, it started because of this triggering of the, the, the cases, the domestic cases, but there was also a PhD that was defended at a, a Swiss university uh, about um, making the case that, you know, the, the, uh, the violence in this period was structural. It was not exceptional or incidental or isolated. It was structural. And, and maybe sometimes I do need think you need outsiders um, uh, to, you know, close your eyes and open them again and see things differently. Uh, so if you are in your own society, you have your own narratives and it's difficult to get out. So you need to be pushed from outside. So, so I think also there with domestic and international fora, it goes back and forth. And I think it has to go back and forth to go forward and to make sure you keep moving. Thank you. If you could just allow me to ask, I don't know if it's possible to get the name of the student. I don't know if it's something you could share. That's one question. And then to ask if we all know about Nora Whitman's work, because I think that she has tried in that huge work and she's a lawyer herself, but she used history to prove that it was not legal at the time. I mean, it's a huge research that she has done. And I think that this is one of the things that um, lawyers would need to help them in this case. Yeah, so well, the I name, can... oh yes, I can, sorry. Sorry, no, no, go ahead, Professor. No, the, the name is uh, Remy Limpach, but it was a historian PhD, not a, a legal one. And of course, then there's also always this question to what extent historians should use legal terms. So how, how can they go should they go back and forth or can they go together? This is another uh, question, but just to answer your first question. I just wanted to say that we've um, been, after every panel session, we've invited, the always interesting materials have come out in this session and we send them to participants as well as posted them on our website after. So it, certainly any of these materials that we're all referring to, feel free to email them to me and we'll make sure that they are disseminated, even materials that you think of after the session. Um, so with that, Professor Angi, would you like to answer the question as well as any responses you have to the other remarks so far? Um, so um, uh, let me try. Uh, uh, it's such a, a variety of questions and uh, such uh, difficult questions that I, in a way I'm not uh, quite sure where to start. So uh, let me begin with a basic principle, perhaps, which is uh, one of the most fundamental ideas about the law is that the law should promote justice. I think that is where we should begin in terms of this whole uh, discussion of reparations. And um, I think the complication uh, with international law is that, as uh, Ambassador Komishon pointed out, uh, it might have been the case that in national legal systems, slavery, for example, was abolished and was prohibited. My fear or my concern is that international law was precisely a mechanism which entrenched discrimination within it. In other words, international law was precisely a set of doctrines which said you can't do this domestically, but you can do this internationally to people outside, to people beyond, uh, you could say, uh, the, uh, beyond um, you know, the realm of civilization. I think this is a fundamental structure about, of international law, precisely because international law was colonial in its dimensions. We can see this sort of 
uh, dichotomy in lots of different ways. So for example, another way in which we can see this dichotomy is that international law and national law has been obsessed with the protection of property. We can see that as being a major feature of national legal systems. Now, at precisely the time that great scholars like Grotius were developing doctrines directed at protecting property, they were also developing doctrines that would completely dispossess entire continents. So can we see that du dual duality of international law? So Grotius on the one hand was expanding the realm of property, but at the same time, it was precisely the teachings of Grotius which would actually uh, justify the conquest of the Banda Islands. And that would justify the dispossession of, of you know, entire continents, uh, the peoples in North, uh, the indigenous people of North Africa, uh, sorry, North America, the indigenous peoples of Australia. So international law had this dual function of protecting the interests of the, the co colonizers and people seen as civilized while entirely disempowering the uncivilized. So then, uh, so th that is the structure of international law. Now we might try to include, uh, as uh, was suggested, national concepts or national principles and say, those are the principles that should apply universally. But this takes us to the question of what sort of a tribunal or a court are we going to try and bring these claims in? And um, you know, my uh, own experience with the Nauru case is that what I found really interesting about the Nauru case was this was entirely a case about colonial reparations. But the lawyers involved in the case were extremely reluctant to present it as a case about colonial reparations and quite understandably. Because I think, again, as the ambassador pointed out, who is going to make these decisions? What is their training? What is their outlook? What is their concept of the applicable law? So this case about colonial reparations, or a case that I saw as being all about colonial reparations, was presented as a case about treaty violation. And this goes back to what uh, Professor um, um, uh, von Herrick mentioned, which is how the, even the courts in Holland want to sort of address the phenomenon without presenting or, ex or really uh, uh, in any way addressing the structural factors that are involved in this. And we can see this going on in reparations in lots of different ways. You know, we can see this with the Herero situation where attempts are being made to pay the Herero or pay Namibia, but say, we don't want to mention reparations, right? Uh, so, in my opinion, uh, or uh, you know, given uh, the very conservative character of international law and given what I would call the colonial character of international law, my suggestion would be what is needed is a, uh, is a new tribunal, is a new tribunal that would be informed by the issue of injustice. And this is where I think we should also think about the multiple dimensions of reparations. Uh, so, you know, um, the ambassador, you know, mentioned lots of uh, you know, the different claims being made, all of which are related to reparations. And I think it's a very complex situation because we need multiple disciplines and we can think about law playing different roles in relation to each of those issues. <laughs> you know, so in some cases, law might be effective. Existing law might be effective in relation to some issues, but not in relation to other issues. So it's got to be a much more nuanced and much more you know, thought out approach in uh, these particular circumstances. But for me, at least we, we could begin by going back to the point that colonialism is not a thing of the past. <laughs> you know, so this whole discussion of reparation seems to suggest in some cases that, oh, that was something bad that happened then and we must you know, compensate for something bad that happened then. But I think as this whole panel has pointed out, all these things are continuing. And so we can begin by looking at current structures of governance and everything, and you know, uh, current doctrines and saying, look at the ways in which these current structures of governance and these current doctrines reproduce these colonial relations, reproduce these relations of inequality. You know, so that's very practical and immediate, if, if that makes sense. 
But uh, having said all that, as a lawyer, uh, if I am if I am a lawyer, um, you know, I really feel that what is required is history. I mean, I began as a lawyer, but I turned to history really. And of course, the historians say you're a very bad historian, and perhaps that is the case. But I feel I can't, you know, uh, give up on making some attempt to understand history, both in terms of getting the big picture, but also in terms of understanding the history of the doctrines of international law. Because if we look at the history of many of the doctrines of international law, we can see that those doctrines were created precisely to further colonial relation. You know, so how can you use a doctrine that was furthered, was created precisely to further colonial relations to undo colonialism? I think that's a big issue there. So then we have to go, as uh, uh, Professor uh, Van Herrick uh, pointed out, uh, to you know, broader issues about justice and so forth. And I think it's almost a different, it is really a different tribunal with a different vision, which is much more open to the different potentialities of law that would be in the best position to actually achieve this, uh, rather than you know, the, the given system uh, that we have um, at the moment. May I just say something uh, uh, again, uh, just by way of closing, um, you know, we could think of uh, the reparations project uh, also in terms of another major project which took place in the 60s and 70s. And of course, so much of this was driven by very prominent West Indians, Eric Williams, I mean, in making those fundamental arguments about the, the, fu the function of slavery in bringing about industrialization. There's another West Indian scholar who, who I find very inspiring, and that's Norman Gervin, you know, who, who you know, did a lot of work on this whole question of expropriation and so forth. And so in that period in the 1970s, we saw a similar, similar optimism about the potentiality of international law as a mechanism to bring about international justice. So I would suggest that the reparations project might benefit from having a look at what happened to the new international economic order with that project, which made a very powerful claim about the injustice of the legal system and of the international system and had very optimistic ideas about the potentiality of international law to change these injustices. The new international economic order wasn't very successful, although my colleague Professor Sonaraja disagrees. So I think we might have that uh, experience to learn from as well in terms of this whole question of the potentialities of law. But in the end, I really feel the most important thing um, is perhaps just the issue of epistemological justice. In other words, you know, what I find really interesting is that Europe doesn't know its own history. Europe doesn't know its own history because so much of that history took place overseas. I mean, I find it stunning that there are statues of King Leopold which are celebrated in Belgium. I mean, is there any idea <laughs> within this highly educated population that King, Be King Leopold was responsible for the deaths of something like five to 10 million Africans. I mean, really. And I like to think what encourages me is that many of the young European scholars that I engage with are keen to learn about this. Because they're quite stunned very often when they come across you know, some of these basic facts. Just as some of my American students are stunned to learn that America bombed Laos, dropped more bombs on Laos, then were dropped on Germany. And Laos wasn't even at war with the United States. And these are very well-meaning people. They want to do human rights. They want to engage with projects of international justice. But somehow the education systems don't actually provide uh, any kind of avenue in which you know, people within America can actually understand the history of America outside American borders at least the darker side of that history. And that might also be true, I can see uh, you know, some nodding going on in terms of the history of Holland or uh, the history of uh, Belgium and so forth. So I think it's history and you know, just uh, you know, education that is crucial to this whole project. And Sharin, law might even have some role to play. <laughs> Sharon, could I just say very quickly that the international lawyers of this era have, cannot accept this notion that international law of the 15th, 16th, 17th centuries 
uh, was the monopoly of European colonizing nations. We cannot accept that international law was confined um, to some monopoly by European colonizing nations. We had, we had a whole world economy, a whole world system with all kinds of, 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 of national polities in Africa and Asia and, and, and all across the world. And, 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 and I must insist, anybody who tells me that slavery was legal in, in those past centuries is in fact telling me that they accept that the Africans of that era were not human beings. Because you, you cannot speak about this generally. You have to go back and look at the colonial codes that were enacted. Those colonial codes were based, the, the only way they could have justified the punishments, um, the, 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 re, the penal regime inflicted on those African people was to claim that they were not human beings. And that is precisely what they did. They claimed that they were not human beings. So these things could be imposed upon them. So if you tell me that you accept that slavery was legal back then, you are also telling me you accept that Africans were not human beings in that period of history. And we can never accept that. Thank you, Ambassador. Yeah, um, well, uh, we have uh, 10 uh, minutes uh, for uh, um, so, so I think I should just clarify that in making the state statements that I did, I am not endorsing the idea that Africans were not human beings. What I'm saying is that European scholars whose influence has been very powerful in terms of our whole thinking of international law did make these claims. And in fact, it, it, it was, you know, in fact, you know, if we look at what happened in certain countries like in Australia, they, the, you know, the, the indigenous peoples of Australia were not even accepted as being human. This was presented as being terra nullius. So this goes to the, the point I made about what tribunal are you going to bring this case in? Because if we bring it in a different sort of tribunal, that will be a tribunal which will accept a vision of international law that is much more plural, that in fact encompasses a much greater variety of ideas and a much broader set of societies and their norms. So that is the suggestion I made because if, they are, if we are thinking about the more conventional courts, it is this European international law with all its biases, with all its suppressions, that is in all likelihood going to be administered. Right, thank you. So in the 10 minutes we have left, I just end abandoning the five other questions I had and other participant questions. I just like to summarize all that with one idea that I think bridges history and law, which is that so far, and in many conversations about colonial reparations, there sometimes is an idea that reparations for colonial wrongs are somewhat fringe or exceptional, right? That you have to exceptionally justify it. But actually, if tying together history and law, Professor Angi, for example, brought up the example of the US bombing of Laos. Um, and some of the questions that have come in from our participants are along the lines of asking whether specific cases fall into the category of colonial wrongs. For example, whether Japanese reparations to Co uh, Korean comfort women would count, whether you know, French nuclear testing in, the, in Algeria, the Pacific, um, the US use of Agent Orange in Vietnam. So actually that is a perfect um, segue for me to ask whether actually under international law, reparations for colonial wrongs are not that exceptional because it is quite widely accepted that reparations are due for certain kinds of harm. And in the case, for example, of nuclear testing, uh, the bombing of Laos, um, there, there's, an, there's increasing um, agreement that the reparations for environmental harm. For example, the Ethiopia Eritrean Commission established this, um, the International Court of, this is not colonial 
the colonial context at all, of course, but the International Court of Justice very recently endorsed the idea of reparations for environmental damage. And I just maybe wanted to pass the mic to Professor Avendan Herrick, to, given your expertise as well in international criminal law and other areas of international law, how, whether you have any sort of final observations on the exceptionality of reparations against wider international law. Yeah, the discussion is getting broader and broader, so it's 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 difficult. <laughs> I think um, um, when we talk about reparations, uh, uh, we also have to differentiate perhaps uh, what exactly. So you have financial uh, reparations, but there are of course also other reparations, and maybe also the the approach should be um, uh, differentiated. So um, uh, some. Um, so, so yeah, I what I, I think what I would like to to emphasize, uh, and that's also a point that Professor Angie made, is is the question of what our benchmark is, and whether we want to insist on law and international law as the benchmark, or whether we um, uh, take a broader approach. And then I want to refer back to this uh, advice that I mentioned at the end of my intervention uh, on on colonial looted colonial art, and there. Um, this uh, committee, they looked at uh, international legal instruments and they said, well, um, uh, they're difficult because they're, they are always connected to, um, uh, to uh, armed conflict situations and, and there is this question of intertemporality. And so they said, but they took the principles of that and in the end they based their advice on what they called ethical principles. And I thought that was a very wise approach because so you you re, you refer to law, and you take from law uh, the the core principles that 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 somehow um, uh, underlie that law that that inform the notion of justice that you know needs to be attached to law. But then you you take them and you uh, to build an, an argument based on on ethics rather than on law. And I thought it was a very good approach because then you can uh, get away from this 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 very legalistic. Uh, uh, conversations about intertemporality and so on. So you just take the, the justice part of it and you build your argument on, on ethics. And, and actually, I think then uh, the case might become much stronger. Um, so sometimes we rely on law because we think it's the strongest argument and the strongest tool. But I'm not sure that that is the case here. So maybe we should we should draw on law in a different way. And then, yeah, so so... I thought that it was actually the, the, the remark of Professor Angie, but I think that is that is perhaps the way forward. And that also tunes in with this, what we in a way all uh, refer to this interdisciplinary approach where it's about history, it's about uh, law, but it's also about ethics. Um, so yeah, I think it doesn't really answer your question, but I, I do think it is about what is the best way forward uh, here. Thank you. So in the time we have left, I think I will invite each panelist to give perhaps their last observations and I will have to quite strictly um, administer a limit of one minute. Um, um, so any, any last thoughts or any reflections on the discussion in the session so far? Pe Professor Shepard, perhaps we can start with you. Thank you. As we go forward, I would say that based on the comments about the ignorance about history, especially the history abroad, that, you know, was a part of the history in the North, that we must go on a campaign to make history a mandatory subject in the schools so that we don't have this uh, uh, ignorance of which you spoke, um, Professor Angie. But I also think it's willed ignorance sometimes. I think they know, but because racism is a scaffold for contemporary policies and actions by too many people, then it is a willed ignorance. They know, but they don't want to know. I think also that we have to think about the inequalities and I'm, I'm thinking of Professor Truman's paper um, as well. The inequalities that still go on and the inequalities that are based on, on past actions. Um, we have heard in the Caribbean about the Colombo plan that gave Eastern countries a leg up at independence. Yet when our leaders like Eric Williams and others went to lobby for a plan for the Caribbean, that was denied. Why? We have to ask ourselves those questions. In have to ask you to and finally, the development package of 
the 10 point plan, it, it, it needs cash injection in order to be actualized. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, Professor Shepard. Uh, Professor Angi, do you have any final reflections? So you, I think you're on mute, sorry. Um, okay, my final reflection is um, that uh, we shouldn't, uh, well, I also want to suggest that this problem of racism isn't just a North-South problem. I think it's a problem that we find everywhere in lots of different ways. And in many countries of the South, and I go back to the Bandung Declaration, we find various forms of racism that are very you know, threatening and it's somewhat tragic that many of the countries that signed on to the condemnation of racism at Bandung are countries which themselves uh, are encountering all sorts of issues in terms of racial discrimination and so forth, which need to be addressed. So that would be my one minute. <laughs> Thank you, you have, you finished with 10 seconds to spare. Thank mm -hmm. you very much, um, Professor Vanden Herrick. Um, thank you, yes, I think, um, uh, if we look at uh, what uh, what we can do at universities uh, in in the West or in the Netherlands, uh, then um, uh, I think this question we we, got, we teach still only law or only history. So we see that uh, even if we agree that history is very important for international lawyers, um, and um, uh, International law students are not trained so much in history, and it comes in through cases. But, but I, so I think that is also not only to make certain courses mandatory, but also to to revisit your own uh, approach and to bring history uh, closer to uh, international law uh, students. I think that is a very practical because I think it's also important to be very practical a step that you can take tomorrow. Thank you very much, Ambassador Commission. Would you like to finish us off with your final re reflections? Um, I was in Durban in 2001 when we had that uh, famous battle between um, basically the black and brown world and the white world over those six words and should always have been so. Um, paragraph 13 of the Durban Declaration where we acknowledge that slavery and the slave trade are crimes against humanity and the white countries insisted to put in and should always have been so. And that's because we recognize that um, once uh, uh, an, a wrong qualifies as a genocide or a crime against humanity, it cannot be time barred. There's no statute of limitations on um, genocides and crimes against humanity. So they were trying to, to argue that a crime against humanity is a 20th century concept that doesn't um, go back to previous, previous centuries. Um, we say no, um, the, the, the mankind always had this notion that there are certain acts that so offend the conscience of humanity that they amount to crimes against humanity. So cutting across whether it's colonialism, whether it's slavery, wants the wrong. Um, gets to the level of either a genocide or a crime against humanity, it cannot be time barred. Um, reparations are due. Thank you very much, Ambassador. So okay, that's all the time we have for. Unfortunately, I'm sure we could keep talking about this um, for an entire panel series on its own. But thank you very much to all, um, all our panelists for joining us for such a fascinating discussion. I'm sorry for the issues we couldn't cover and I, I'm sorry to the participants whose questions I couldn't cover, but it's a great testament to how interested people are in this topic and how much there is still left to discuss. And I would encourage, well, any materials that any of the panelists want disseminated, we're happy to do so. This panel series is meant to suggest practical ways um, of reconceptualizing international law in all its areas. And so I would encourage everyone to continue having these discussions in their different capacities, their areas of practice and their um, legal community, legal and other communities. Um, and that, so it just remains for me to thank the panelists again. Um, thank you to our co-organizers, Gibson Dunn and the Trail uh, Seminar at UCLA.
and to our co-sponsors, the, the co our co-sponsor, the Center for International Law at the National University of Singapore and to everybody for joining us. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>